recording started. There we go. And uh, we will have this recording added into the uh, YouTube feed about an hour or so upon the conclusion of this webinar. So if you want to access that, you can find that link on Twitter, on Daily Effects, a uh, plethora of different avenues. But let's get to those risk disclaimers and then we could bring on the chart and get into the session. Risk disclaimer part one, trading is risky. You need to know that. If you're not familiar with this, please take a few moments to familiarize yourself with it. And then we'll move on to disclaimer part two in about five seconds. All right, there we go. Disclaimer part two, the hypothetical trading disclaimer. Um, we're going to look at some past trades. We're going to look at some strategy. Have to know past performance, not indicative of future results. Again, not familiar with this, take a few moments, familiarize yourself with it, and we will move on in just about five seconds. All right, there we have it. So for quite a few of these setups today, I also have accompanying articles. Um, now, the goal of the article is to provide maybe a little bit more depth than what I might be able to discuss here on the webinar. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to type those in and let me know, and I'll be absolutely happy to answer as many as possible. The first setup I wanted to look at today is right here in the British Pound. Now, the British Pound, of course, is still in somewhat of that post-Brexit type of environment. Um, Sterling had topped out here at a 150 big figure. That Brexit fall got us all the way down, kind of flirting with that 130 level. Now, what was really bizarre about price action of the British Pound post-Brexit was the fact that we had some continuation on Monday as another fresh 30-year low, or excuse me, fresh seven-year low was set. Oh, no, this was a 35-year low. Fresh 35-year low was set right in here. Support established. And then we had that recovery on Tuesday and Wednesday. Now, that move on Wednesday was really interesting because it brought us right back up to a prior zone of support at 135.006. Now, this was the financial collapse low. So a really very interesting level that we have right there. 135.006. We even have that down to the tenth of a pip. Now during Brexit, I wouldn't even want to call this support because I mean we we did have a good 275 pips of penetration beyond that level. But if we get down a little bit tighter, we could see where some support had tried to come in around Brexit. I'm going to go down to the hourly now. Tried to come in around that level, wasn't able to hold. See, that's that support that I was referring to right in there. Just about 30 pips above that 135 big figure. Now, that didn't hold. We did get that break. We got that penetration about 275 pips inside of that big level. And then we had that retracement. The following week, we saw this gap lower. There's that extension move on Monday. But then that old level of support ended up becoming a fairly attractive level of resistance. Now, I wasn't looking to sell here yet. I wanted to see a deeper retracement. The expectation that I had is that we were going to see the Bank of England talking up the prospect of rate cuts. I just didn't expect it to happen nearly as fast as it did. Uh, this was Wednesday after Brexit. This was right when Mr. Carney called an impromptu press conference and basically said, guys, I warned you about Brexit. It's happening. We're going to proactively look at a rate cut at some point this summer to try to offset some of these risks. Now, once he said that, that began to prime expectations for this morning's meeting to see a potential rate cut. But there was a couple of reasons for why that may not have taken place. Uh, one is in August, the Bank of England has Super Thursday, in which they also release quarterly inflation reports. Now, traditionally speaking, the Bank of England has often waited for one of those types of meetings to make a move to rates, so that at the very least they can accompany that cut with data. So unless there was something really worrisome going on within the UK economy, which the statement can be made that there is, with some of what we're seeing in some of these real estate funds, it simply made more sense for the Bank of England to save that ammunition, wait for August, pose the cut there when they could also accompany that with inflation forecasts, and then play it based on how the data comes in. Right, because even right here we were like less than one week from the Brexit vote. Um, right now we're just a couple weeks out. So how much has Brexit really impacted near-term data just yet? A statement could be made that we're going to have to wait for a month or two before we really could actually begin to see some of the effects of what that might mean for the UK economy. So 
the price action structure that we saw in this thing, right after Carney began talking about the prospect of a rate cut, it dove down to further lows, right down here, and it essentially eviscerated that retracement that we'd seen on Tuesday and Wednesday of last week. Now, for levels that I'm looking at, the one level that's really attractive, well, a couple that are fairly attractive, the one level that I really like is right here at 138.34. It's had a couple of different things going for it. Uh, one is it was the swing low in February, and before Brexit, that was the post-financial collapse low. But maybe more to the point, if we look at price action during Brexit, and uh, I'm gonna go down like a 15-minute chart. If we look at price action during Brexit. You can see where this level was a quick swing right here. Gave a little bit of resistance. And so it had the prospect of maybe a little bit of continuation potential. Um, uh, showing his resistance, of course. There was another swing high right in here. That was the morning after Brexit. And then of course we had that gap lower. I wanted to see it climb up to 38 and a third before I was gonna look at shorting this pair. I have a secondary level here at 140, and this is just simply a big figure, a uh, uh, rounded psychological level. Had also given a, a, a smidgen of support just as those Brexit results were beginning to come into markets. Also gave us a visceral bounce of 575 pips after that level got hit. So I'm using this as like an S3 zone, or rather an R3 zone of potential resistance. And I'm open to using each of these zones although I'm going to be really passive with 135. And the reason is because of how parabolic this move was this morning when we had that no rate cut out of the BOE. Now, the reason that I'm staying on a bearish stance is because it still looks as though we are going to get a rate cut out of the Bank of England. It just looks like it's not going to happen yet. It looks like we might have to wait until August for that. But I would like to see this pair climb up a little bit more. A little bit more. Up towards that 38 and a third level so that I could look at getting that next short position. Using this as that prior swing high, just a little south of 140, in the effort of looking for that continuation eventually. Now, if we just break above 138.34, where we don't see any resistance, I'll still be open to selling off of 140, although I'm gonna be a little bit more tepid about it because that, at that stage, means we have like a 1200 plus pip retracement. And that, uh, I wanna be really cautious of trying to fade off a 1200 plus pip move in a really short period of time. So, British pound uh, against the US dollar, I'm gonna still retain a bearish stance. There is one somewhat delineating factor here that uh, also makes that, that bearish stance in the cable fairly attractive to me, and that's the fact that the US dollar has held these highs while ranging around in the post-Brexit environment. Right, there was the US dollar pop on Brexit, continuation on Monday. Since then, we basically watched it range around. And I'm not looking for a rate hike out of the U.S. anytime soon, but I do think that of, of, of the major economies, it's probably one of the few that might, dare I say, be closest to a rate hike. I don't want that to sound overly presumptuous, but this is kind of a case of the, uh, the least stinky. Uh, I see quite a few folks asking if we're going to be looking at pairs other than the sterling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll definitely be incorporating a few other pairs. Uh, I have a lot on the yen today as well. Uh, but like I said, feel free to type in whatever setups you want to look at. And I'll do the absolute best that I can with the time that we have allotted today. Right in here, you can get another kind of look at this recent little range that's been developing in the U.S. dollar. And we're currently at support in the range. And so that's just another contributing factor that could make the prospect of, of short side continuation in the British pound against the U.S. dollar an attractive set up moving forward. Uh, now, like I said, I do have an accompanying document here if you want to get a little bit more information. I'm going to put this in the chat box for anybody so interested. There we go. Um, and uh, like I said here, let it rip for now, look for a better level of support, then look to get that continuation move uh, at one of these deeper levels. Now, not everything on my charts is bearish sterling right now. Uh, I know a lot of folks are looking for the continuation after Brexit, you know, under the presumption that Brexit is going to be this earth-shattering deal for the UK. 
I think that's putting the cart before the horse, um, at least for right now. All that we know is that this is a big bag of uncertainty. I think Europe's actually maybe exposed a little bit more. But one economy that is undoubtedly in a tough spot and going to need to be doing something different is Japan. And we have seen some movements on that front this week, which is what makes this somewhat of an attractive idea. Um, so Abinomics is right here, put in an extremely strong move of weakness, uh, well, an extremely strong move in the dollar yen, extreme move of weakness in the yen. And then you can see over the past nine months as China's economy started to blow up, well, China's stock market started to blow up right here, started to filter out to the rest of the world right here in August of 2015. January and February of 2015 is when we started to see those global concerns get a little bit more worrisome. And so the bizarre part of this whole theme is that here on dollar yen, you can see that we retraced over 50% of the Abinomics move that took like three and a half years to build in basically like nine months in a really short period of time. We saw a big portion of that move erased. If we plot this over in the pound yen, it's even more pronounced because now we also have the implementation of Brexit concerns pricing lower on the British pound, right? So here's that obby move. And I'm actually giving this a little bit of room, but the obby move I'm considering from this low up to that high. And then notice at its peak, we'd retraced more than 80% of that move in like nine months. So Japan knew that they had to do something, or they still know that they have to do something. Uh, Nikkei, another good example. We got a big move here on the back of economics. And we saw like over 38.2% of that get retraced in a really short period of time. And now price action on the Nikkei has been finding support here on this 38.2 retracement, 15.616. So this weekend, Shinzo Abe's coalition won a supermajority in the upper house of parliament which essentially gives them significantly less resistance in passing constitutional reforms and economic stimulus. This basically gives Shinzo Abe a little more of a blank check to try to stimulate the Japanese economy. The major thought being that Japan is going to come in with a big, big program of some kind down the road at some point. Probably in the fall, but maybe a little bit earlier than that. The Bank of Japan has shown a penchant for surprises over the past year or so. It's one of those areas where you really want to check your expectations because they're catching a lot of folks off guard. But the logic of the theme is, 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 is relatively sound in the fact that Japan is probably going to need to do more. There's now a removal of political resistance to doing more. And they don't really have a lot of other options. So since that weekend win, we've seen some, some very different price action in the yen. Notice that extreme bout of strength that lasted for like nine months. It's showing the sharpest topside moves that we've had since that risk aversion from China kicked off. Uh, yes, this video will absolutely be recorded and available on YouTube like about an hour after we're done. Let's go down to the weekly chart. There we go. See, so ever since we topped out in June of last year, these topside moves in pound yen, weakness in the yen, have been far more abbreviated than what we saw this week. So this is just another case of a potential game-changing piece of data that could promulgate risk trends for a couple weeks, a couple months, the very, at the very least leading into the fall. When, when Japan is expected to drop a hammer of a really big stimulus. So I like the idea of looking for upside here on the prospect of yen weakness, even with all those question marks surrounding the British pound. I have a couple other ways to extrapolate this theme. We'll look at those here in a moment. But here's the way that I'm going to look to play pound yen. So we look at that longer term chart, still make the case for the bearish move, given that in, you know. A, a, outsized jump that we had around Briggs. The solid drop all the way from 160 down to like 135 in, in the course of one trading day. But more recently, we get down on this four hour chart, you can see where we've been developing continuation of higher highs, and higher lows, and a higher high. Now I'm trying to catch that higher low. 
I got a couple of zones that I'm looking at to do that. <clears throat> um, one, I'm going to get this horizontal line drawn up a little bit further to right about 139.50. And then there's another level of interest at a buck 40, major psychological level. Now I'm going to call this my S1 zone. That's really tight to near term price action though. So I want to have a contingency plan of some kind. Don't want to put all my eggs in that basket. Because it's pound yen. It might just throw the basket out of the window. Traditionally a volatile pair and, and you know, the stakes can uh, it could be argued that the stakes are raised at this point with you know major macroeconomic changes in the representative economies of each side of this pair. Now a bit lower, there's another level of interest that I'm looking at, right around 137.50. And you can almost see those see those inflection points here on the four hour chart. If I get down a little tighter, it'll be a little more visible. But right around 137.50, we have another level of interest, a zone, if you will. I'm gonna color this up to get these lows right in here. And so now I could look for a secondary level of support. Now, the benefit behind something like this is the fact that if I do, in fact, see price dropping down to catch support here, and it does catch support, well, then I have that higher low above this level at 136, um, to be exact, 136, 37. Now, if we break below 135, 47, that's when I want to begin to question that topside bullish thesis. Uh, this is the 764. of that omnionics move right in there. So this is S1. I see a bunch of questions on this. Now, um, when I say S1, I just mean like support one, uh, not necessarily supply. I know there's a lot of folks that use that uh, term interchangeably with support. I personally don't. Supply demand to me is it sounds a little bit more telling, if you will. All that we know at this point is this is a potential zone where buyers might be able to come in. We don't know that there's going to be a supply overchange or anything like that, or at least I don't. If anybody else does, I'd love to see that crystal ball. Um, so I try to use uh, you know a more accurate terminology, just calling it like support one, and then I'd have support two right down here. Now on this pair, I'm not even going to use an S3. If we break below that 135.47 zone, I want to cool the jets on any, any uh, bullish aspirations that I have on the pair. Because again, it's pound yen. It has a penchant for being volatile as is. And given the fact that we have you know two overriding concerns here and Brexit in the UK, a potential um, you know, bazooka of, of stimulus coming for Japan, I don't know how aggressive I want to get on pushing this thing in either direction. But if I can see support developing in either of these regions, that gives me a game plan with which I can look for a continuation of this trend that appears to be forming on this four-hour chart. Now, effectively, what I've done here is I've created a way, or trying to create a way, where I could trade this using the dollar yen without necessarily having to take on too much exposure in USD or JPY while being able to focus on that volatility in the GBP. Okay. It's a, a form of portfolio exposure management. So in that case, if the British pound gets stronger, fantastic. I have that pound yen set up that can play. If the British pound gets weaker, fantastic. I have that pound dollar set up that can play. The goal here is to try to put myself in a position where I can be successful a higher percentage of the time, even if I'm removing some of the top side uh, re reward potential by hedging off some of that exposure. But pound yen, pound dollar to me are showing diverging setups, and that's an enticing type of theme to be working with in a marketplace. Um, I got a few other pairs though. Like I said, keep keep pumping those those questions in. I'll answer as many as I possibly can during the Q and A. Um, Euro yen. I also have an article on this. Now Euro yen has a really interesting level in play right now, one fifteen thirty seven. You can see where this had built in a support here just a couple days ago. Oh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. Right, but same type of thing. We have that visceral topside move that bashed through prior swing highs. We now have that higher high, higher low, higher high. Now the big question is when's that higher low going to come into play? A um, couple different ways that we can look into this. 
if you want an article with the full setup, a little more detail, I'm going to put that in the chat box right now. I'm going to go over it right here. All right, so daily chart. All right, same kind of story as the pound yen. All right, with the exception that we also had that additional dash here or weakness on ECBQE in here. But, you know, in reality, since June of last year, this thing has been in a stark downtrend. Let's watch it trade off from 140 uh, all the way down sub 110. Opionomics took a few years to build. It took nine months to to be eviscerated out of markets, or a good portion of it. But what I've done here is I've taken the low from the pre obby move up to the high that we had set in 2014. And the 618 of that move, of that obbyomics move, comes right in at 115 at spot 37. Now this level became interesting to me right here. This, this was the week before Brexit. Now, if you guys remember the way that the whole Brexit scenario played out, uh, one week before Brexit, um, a member of parliament was assassinated in the UK. And there was a whole scenario surrounding it where it was a uh, apparently a pro-Brexit activist that had made some political statements in the process. Now, the, the reason I bring this up is because the thought at the time was that, that was going to impact the vote. At that point, it became maybe a little bit more obvious that, okay, well, maybe we're going to see a Remain vote because this type of political volatility could solidify the other side. And so just one week ahead of that Brexit referendum is when we saw a lot of these risk-on moves beginning to come back. Notice this quick rip here in the Euro Yen where we had jumped from that low just above that 115.37 level up to the 50 fib of that same retracement. Right, so a greater than 500 pip run in a really short period of time, like six trading days, just out of Brexit. Um, Sterling put in an enormous move around that theme. Here's 616. That was the day that she was assassinated. Uh, it was Joe Cox, if you want to Google and get the details. And we had ripped all the way up to that 150 big figure before putting that dramatic Brexit drop. Right, but this was market's pricing and the foregone conclusion of a remain vote that didn't end up happening. Now, where this becomes relevant is that price action inflection that I had on, on, on 6.16, just a full week ahead of Brexit, has ended up coming back off that 115.37 Fibonacci level. Let's go down a little bit tighter for our chart. So there's that 115.37 support, or the support is north of that. Here's the Brexit move. The Brexit bounce. Where do you think it catches support? or excuse me, resistance, right off prior support, right off that Fib level. So until this weekend's news, I was looking at using this as a re-entry level on the short side of the move. But we have not gotten that yet. As a matter of fact, this level didn't show resistance at all. It's now showing support. We also have another interesting instance going on here. This is a projected trend line that can be found. by taking the low from the financial collapse, I'm going to go out to the daily chart for this, taking the low from the financial collapse, right in here, or excuse me, this is low from the tech bust, even deeper. Uh, take the low that was set in the year 2000, connect that to the low in March of 2011, and then project that trend line. Now this trend line tests out okay. I say okay because we had a couple of instances just a couple months before this touch. A little bit of resistance in here. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't a hard set line in the sand. Let me check this out. See where it projects to right now. Just a little bit north of 115.37. It also caught that low the week before Brexit. So even though that low came in a little bit north of my 115.37 level, well, I have a reason as to why it came in. Projection of an old, old trend line. And there we go. There's that level becoming support now. So this becomes the basis of the of the setup. I know that I have a level down here that's being widely watched. This is a level that I could use in my analysis. If this is something that I want to trade on to the long side, I simply want to look to get stops on the other side of support developing around that zone. 
Okay, now the lowest low that I have around that zone that I would consider support is right here on this wick, which is about 114.90, which means I want to get my stop on the position set about 114 and three quarters. I want to give that a little bit of wiggle room, all right? Because when you have a swing low or a swing high, it kind of sticks out. Market makers see that. If we see price down, just dancing just a little bit above support, market maker might be able to push that down real quick, clear those stops, let it fly back up. So at the very least, I want to get my stop below that wick by about 10, 15 pips. As of right now, that setup will cost me about 250 pips of risk if I want to try to buy it up here, which I don't. I want to wait. I want to let it come down. There's a level right in here about 116.40 up to about 116.50. It could be a really attractive zone. Let's get a little tighter hourly chart. There we go. You see that, that synchronized swing high? Right there. There it goes my S1. If I could get support in this zone, then at that point I could look to get a stop just on the other side of that. Okay, now it's a little bit more of an amenable stop, but maybe more to the point, I could look to begin taking profits when we get up here to the prior swing high at 118. And then if we do get that burst higher, if I could get this back up to almost like the 120 level, then I have another Fibonacci level right up here. 618 of that, that big picture move, taking the 2000 low up to the 2014 high. Now set up like that could become attractive, but again, from here I only have like 270 pips upside potential. I don't want to take on 250 pips of risk just to get 270 and call it a day. I need to get that entry a little bit tighter. I need to get my risk a little bit tighter. And support down here could allow that. Now, if we do get a deeper break, I'm still going to look at this as an S2 support zone. And if I get support down here, I'm simply going to cast that stop a little bit deeper. There is a level at 114 that I could use for that function. Just mark these up, make it a little more clear. Now the level at 114 where that comes in is when we had this kind of chunky, choppy range in here, that would give me a level of support, like right around that 114 big figure. And then more to the point, came in as resistance, decent little check of support on the way up. So if I'm going to get something in this zone to play for a topside move, I'm simply going to look at my stop on the other side of this level. And those same profit targets become active at 118, 119.90. But if I'm able to get it down in this zone, then I can begin looking to take profits a little bit quicker, like maybe a 117.50. So another yen setup in which I might be able to look for some continuation on the prospect that we're going to see um, markets continuing to try to front run central banks. That's one of the most predominant themes that we've seen in the post-financial collapse environment. And uh, I have an article on that. It'll explain it in more detail. It's uh, right in here. I'm going to put this in the chat box for anybody so interested. There we go. All right, I see we have a ton of questions, so uh, I'm going to go with one more setup, and then we'll begin getting to questions. Gold. So gold's extremely interesting here because it appears as though we've seen and this is more over the last eight months, we've seen a pivot in central bank outlook. Whereas central banks were just kind of trying to pull the wagon along and the Fed was looking at rate hikes up, up until February of this year when they began to get really dovish. It appeared as though the monetary expansion era in markets was at the very least taking a brief pause. And that can help explain the multi-year downturn that we'd seen in gold. Right, like if 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 you think of gold and you think of the financial collapse moving gold, a lot of folks just imagine, well, everybody was worried, so everybody just flowed into gold and it just continued to pop higher. No, gold went into a bear market as well. Uh, gold had traded up to a thousand in April of 2008, and by November, we we're down to 682. That's more of a more than a 30% cut in five months. That's a bear market. Bear market is 20% or more, right? But this was the really attractive move that happened in gold. And, and we have to ask ourselves, what brought this on? Was this all risk aversion? 
Not necessarily. Because this is also around the time we started to see stocks going back up. At least when the brute por portion of this move was coming in. This was monetary expansion. This was central banks doing QE and looking at looser for longer policies and ways of diluting fiat currencies in order to, to jam liquidity into the financial system by basically giving money to banks. And so the prospect for eventual inflation was rather subdued as this expansion was going on. And then as expansion began to slow, or at least when it began to, to look as though and maybe near, that's when inflation expectations started to pull, go a little bit lower. And it was this year when that theme really has appeared to capitulate. So this channel down here had lasted for like two plus years in gold. It was rather consistent. You can see that on a monthly chart here. If we go down to the daily, we're going to see quite a few hits off that channel. All right, rather consistent little channel in here. Now, what happened here is really interesting. At the early portion of the year, it looked as though we were going to have a pretty gnarly scenario to deal with in financial markets. Um, you know, the Fed was at the time talking up four rate hikes. In, in, uh, or as we came into the year, Fed was talking up the prospect of four rate hikes in 2016. I mean, this wasn't, you know, <laughs> this wasn't brain surgery. Um, if you go to my Twitter page, I have this thing. I had pinned it. And we even kind of told you this was a problem and probably going to be a bigger problem. It ended up becoming a huge problem. And that's when we started to see the Fed back off the idea of four hikes in 2016 to try to turn the corner of some of these global risks, like um, the carnage that was being seen in oil prices at the time, the massive slowdown that was being seen in China. Um, and then, of course, the prospect of a rising rate environment after six years of ZERP, zero interest rate policy. And so as the Fed backed down to rate hikes, gold went near parabolic. We caught this move where it went 1087 all the way up to like 1250 in less than a month. And then it began to establish this bullish, bullish structure, caught support off this really long-term Fibonacci level. Uh, XAU is uh, gold. Uh, AU is the chemical element for gold, which is where the XAU comes from. And then we saw the higher high burst up to this level, which is another big Fibonacci level. Let me show you where these levels come into play at. So, yeah. no, I'm not just pulling them out of the air. So the black retracement that I have is taking the low in 1968 up to that same 2011 high. The one that I have in blue is taking the low from 1999 up to that same high. Now the levels of interest here are 1200 spot 41. 61.8% of that big long-term 50-year move, and then 1283.82, which is 61.8% of the 1999 to 2011 move. These two levels have provided some pretty good price action over the very recent past, right in here. Now, for short term, we have this 50 fib at 1301, and this is simply taking the financial collapse low in gold up to that same 2011 high. Okay, now each of these levels are going to become relevant as we drill down here. It's got another weekly chart. And you can see some of that price action developing there. There's that quick burst breaking out of the channel. There's support. The 618 of the 50 year move. There's resistance just kissing off of the 618 of that secondary move with the 1999 low. There's 1241 coming in again as support. Let's go down to the daily. There's that support hit. Just a beautiful kiss off that 1241. A little more resistance at 1283. And then we had Brexit. Another just big risk factor that had a ton of uncertainty. So you get down to this four-hour chart, you can see where this burst of activity had a little bit of continuation. We even printed a fresh high by a penny. This high beats this high by like one cent. Now it's begun trending lower. 
which for me is a good thing because I want to buy it, just don't want to buy it here. I've got a couple different levels that I could look to in the effort of getting long. Let's go back to the daily chart so we can define it a little bit better. Now this zone right in here between 1283.82 up to 1301, this could be an attractive zone if we get price action down there. The worry that I have is that if we do get price action down there, it may be a violent move. I mean, I'm looking for another 30 bucks to come off. Another 30 bucks comes off uh, gold prices. There might be something else going on there. So if we do get down to this zone, I'm going to still want to evaluate the environment to make sure that I'm not to make sure that I'm not buying into a, you know, a massive downtrend. But it's a level that could become usable. Perhaps more interesting is this little swing high right in here. Again, that was the week right before Brexit, before that Remain vote started to get priced in really heavily. And so I could use this for another zone of support. Let me get this a little tighter though so we can get a few more wicks from that four hour chart in there. There we go. All right, you can see we had a little bit of run down here in 1312 on that low. 1327 up there, that's going to be a little rich. But this gives me a rough zone to look to for support. Now we've just gotten down to the top end of the zone, uh, i.e., matching off some of these resistance points right back here. Now at this stage, that looks like a lower high. I'm not ready to buy this yet. I want to see it dig a little bit deeper. And then once it begins making higher highs and higher lows, that's when I could look to jump on it on the hourly chart in concert of what I'm seeing or trying to trade on the daily chart, looking for that uptrend continuation. Now here's the thing with this the top side moving gold. Um, in the way that we looked at how Abinomics has come off of many of these yen pairs, as in it took three years to build, nine months to get out, well, the gold has been doing kind of the opposite. Where the top side trend move has been quick and violent and very fast. And the downside move has been a lot of grind and a lot of chop. Violent move, a lot of chop. Violent move, a lot of chop. See, a good example right in here. Right, very little retracement on the way up. Okay, very little retracement on the way up. Brexit, very little retracement on the way up. It's a quick move and then it just churned. Quick move, churn. Quick move, churn. Right? So you got to kind of have an expectation for that type of behavior to continue because this is a portion of a risk trade. It's not just the prospect of central bank easing. We're also seeing flows come into this on the back of risk aversion. So the key becomes getting long at the right time. As in, if I buy it off here, or if I buy it right now just because it's hit the upper end of my zone, and I look to get a stop just below support, or even if I look to get it down here, it could grind against me and, and continue to move, right? And that's why I'm going to wait for this thing to confirm up a little bit more before I'm going to look to trigger a long side position because the counter trend move aggressively grinding against folks. So in essence, the prospect here is we either got to A, try to pick a bottom, or B, let some of the move get away so that we can confirm the fact that it is going to show some uptrending tendencies, which would then entail a wider stop, a weaker risk reward. Not ideal, right? But it's 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 kind of an example of trying to match the environment of what we're seeing in a market at the time, we're trying to mold the approach to what it is that we're looking to work with. Uh, those are the setups that I have for today. I uh, want to see what kind of questions you ladies and gentlemen have. Now, if you do want some additional information on the gold move, uh, also have an article on that. This was from Monday. I'll put that in the chat box for anybody so interested. There we go. All right, I want to start getting to you, uh, getting to the questions from you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll answer as many as I can here in the uh, remaining 20 minutes that we have. Uh, Timothy Foley, is this pair of pound dollar going to climb back to the 145 levels? I don't know. I mean, when it comes to you know trying to catch the the apex of a move or or the low of a move, I'm personally of the belief that that's 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 um, that there's there's far other more constructive activities that we could be working with, um, which means if if I'm going to base my entire approach off a top at like 145, there's a case we made for a 145-ish type of run. Um, 
but what if it gets up to 143.71, which I have a big level there, and then turns around? Well, then I have to obviate that approach and, and, and readjust anyways. So rather than trying to predict where it's going to peak out or where it's going to bottom out, I'm simply going to try to run with this price action. Um, if resistance shows at one of my levels, that's an opportunity for me to play a reversal with a stop above the high. If it goes in that direction, great. If not, lose small. Um, but you know, trying to project how deep a move might run, that is difficult because it's contingent on a couple of factors. It's contingent on A, the environment that's kind of feeding into that, uh, to that market, i.e. the news. And, and then B, how markets are going to respond to that news, uh, especially right now with the UK when a lot of what is driving this thing is political innuendo, right? And that's traditionally a very difficult thing to trade. So I'm just going to try to trade price action, go with the flow, trade what I get. Um, if this thing does burst above 145, I'm almost willing to promise that I'll be in a bullish type of stance. I mean, a, a 1,200 pip run is significant. If, if you know, we're moving 1,700 pips off the lows, that's really significant. And that means that we're probably seeing something else go on there, right? Like uh, the U.S., um, you know, maybe like the Fed just completely backing off forward guidance, completely backing off of rate hikes this year. Something like that might be able to provide the ammunition for, for, for that type of move. Um, other than that, I'm just kind of a go with the flow kind of guy, man, and I, I try to get setups as they come about rather than, you know, trying to put too much into the front end of what might build into that setup. Uh, but when it comes to possibility, I try to assign, like, uh, you know, a brute force of chaos into all this stuff, saying, you know, 145 is totally possible, just like 150, 160 might even be possible. You know, it's all dependent on a bunch of factors that I don't yet know. And when I walk into the office tomorrow, I want to be able to react, you know, as efficiently as I can with the stimuli that's available. Uh, Dennis Broderick, I'm sorry, Dennis, I'm not sure which period you're referring to, but he asks, uh, is there a reverse head and shoulder presently, how to play? Uh, I do not play head and shoulders patterns at all. Um, I personally never had success with them, so I just ignore them. And the reason is because if we're going to build in a head and shoulders, that's going to be resultant of like six different moves. And if it's making six different moves, then that means I have a hard set level of resistance to work with on an inverted or support to work with on a uh, on a traditional. I'm just going to play the support with price action, you know, a little more near term, but I've never personally had a lot of great luck trading head and shoulders patterns. So I try to stick with what uh, with what's worked for me. Uh, a lot of folks want to look at uh, Aussie Yen. Yeah, no problem. Could definitely pull up some Aussie Yen. So good little channel down here. It's a good little channel. I mean, a couple of, of decent resistance checks off a weekly chart, support checks off a weekly chart. All right, so that one tests out okay. Um, let's go down to the daily. There we go. So here's my consternation with this. Um, I don't know how deeply I would want to build in bids on the Aussie right now. There might be kind of an overhanging effect that the RBA is going to be a little bit tepid towards rate cuts for fear of putting even more air in the property bubble there. Um, but if I'm looking for candidates to get long against a short yen, I don't know if Australia is going to be up there. Maybe New Zealand, um, because they've actually come out and said, you know, hey, we're going to focus on macro potential because we have actual fears of a real estate bubble building here. And so that was kind of the loose implication that RBNZ is not going to be cutting rates anytime soon for fear of putting even more air into that bubble. Um, Australia, RB hasn't been as clear on that topic. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to get as as, uh, as, as, as bought into uh, long Aussie as maybe long key. But still workable. This is still workable. Just crossed a big figure, excuse me, again today. And you see where we'd, we'd seen price action fight with that figure for a couple of days. That's the big figure at 80 flat. These psychological levels, they just keep coming back and keep coming back. Uh, see a question in there uh, with time frame for resistance. You know, something like psychological levels are fantastic because they're applicable across time frames. You know, like I just drew this up on the uh, the 80 on the daily chart. Go down to the hourly chart. It's still going to have a little little ammo in there. Resistance support. Go back. Yeah, it's kind of sloppy, but you know, some in there as well. 
Um, but yeah, something like this could become usable. It gives me a relative zone here to look for support. And the stop isn't going to be as attractive because this is just a quick swing at like 79.50. You know, for a support zone, this might actually be a little more attractive right down here. And I'm looking like 78 and three quarters up to 79. And, you know, so if I could catch some support down here around that 80 big figure, and I'd maybe even color that down to like 79.87 to get that swing in there. But if I could get some support into this zone, I might be able to look at a stop below the prior swing to look for that continuation type of move. And if, you know, again, if we do see that continuation in yen weakness, that's a theme that could last, right? Because this, uh, you know, anticipation of central bank action has been by far one of the biggest drivers across global financial markets over the past seven years. There hasn't been a lot of good stuff happening in, in global economy, in, in any economy in the world over the past seven years. There hasn't been a lot of great stuff at all. The one big driver of strength has been central bank saying, we're not gonna let the whole house fall down. And if we're seeing another iteration of that out of Japan, it could last, it could continue. Um, you know, Q4 2012, that's when Shinzo Abe came into power. Gave us a big topside run in here on Aussie Yen. Uh, so there might be a topside continuation play off the 80 support right in that zone. Stop below the prior swing. Uh, if it cuts through, that's okay. You can maybe even look at re-entry down here again, uh, like 77 and a half, another big psych level. And, you know, the way this gap played through the level was pretty interesting. But this could be like a secondary zone of support to be working with. Get that candle body closed, get that high, get those lows, get that high. So it's going to be like S2. Now, if we break below here, like 76 and a quarter, abandon the bullish stance, and I'm going to maybe begin lining up short positions. Uh, Jimmy Colazzo, will the pound dollar be long until August? Um, age old question, though, right? Like, if, if, uh, if you and me and 20 other people are in a room, we start to smell fire, are you going to wait for somebody else to jump out of the door before you do first? Um, that's what makes these types of themes of anticipation so incredibly interesting because, you know, if, if, if something gets baked into the environment as a foregone conclusion, then we'll likely see it get priced in far before it ever happens. Um, it's another reason that I want to be a little bit more flexible with those short side re-entries in the cable. Um, you know, because as, as, as far as longer term price action is concerned, I'm fairly convinced that we will get some element of weakness in the near term future on the back of the prospect of more rate cuts. And Carney's already said as much. Um, the big sticking point is, you know, popping a rate cut three weeks after a referendum when much of the data that is being used doesn't really reflect what happened to that referendum. But how high it might go, I don't know. Um, you know, 38 and a quarter, or excuse me, 38 and a third is that zone that I'm looking for right now. Um, but I could be acceptable with a 35 flat or maybe even a 40 flat type of level. From James Davis, if you have a micro account or a beginner, what do you suggest for buys and sells? I think that trading is like a lot of other things in life where experiences, and, and I know that a lot of folks that are maybe just getting to charts don't want to hear this, but this is just my honest opinion, um, where experience is really the best thing. Um, so I think that you know maybe at first, if you're still kind of working through some of these questions, just try to get as many trades as you can on a demo account. And here's the point behind this, and I know a lot of folks hate hearing it. You know, oh, the demo account's not fun. You don't feel the risk, all that other stuff. I think the emotional aspect of trading is 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 just another aspect of the the problem, right? The problem is trying to forecast the future with imperfect information, and adding in an emotional component to that is likely not going to help anybody, at least at first. So I think if you could get a lot more comfortable with the mechanical sides of things, um, the entry, your strategy, your trading plan, I think that that's going to make the emotional side that much more easy to, to kind of manage uh, when you do have those conflicts. Um, as far as the field of study, I'm, I'm a big proponent of price action, as you probably have heard about <laughs> this webinar. Um, and the reason for that is I've been doing this for a long time, and, and what I found a long time ago was that my best ideas often – end up working out the worst. <laughs> and and it's not because the idea is bad, it's because I put too much credit to the idea, right? And as in, 
this price right now in the Aussie yen is actionable across marketplace, uh, across the marketplace, right? Goldman Sachs can act on this, uh, RBS can act on this. I mean, it's the same you know type of interbank market rate that a lot of these banks can act on. And if it was a foregone conclusion that the Aussie yen was going to go up, I'm of the opinion that Goldman Sachs would already beat me to it. Because those guys, they're not stupid. They're not going to leave free money out there in a the market. They're going to price it in as quickly as they can. And the very act of them buying, of, of big institutional players buying, is going to push price higher, giving us a deeper, uh, a deeper move. So to me, much more important is risk reward, risk management. Um, you know, you, trying to use analysis to just get a slight bias in my favor when I trigger into a setup, but I go in fully well knowing that there's a good chance I'm going to lose on any individual setup, so I plan for that. And then if I don't lose, that's when I get to do my job as a trader and managing a, a winning position. Um, I think it also helps from a mental standpoint because when you do keep those expectations in check, when you do take, and I don't even want to use this word, but when you do take a somewhat cynical view towards markets, it makes it maybe a little bit easier um, to handle the downside while you know, kind of managing the excitement of the upside. Um, now, all that being said, I I love this stuff. I love what it is that I do, and you know, taking that vantage point is what uh, kind of allows me to come into the office every day excited. You know, even though I've been doing this now 17, 18 years. Um, no, 17, 1999. It's when I turned 18 and got my first trading account. Uh, from Sean Cooney, would you consider the bullish high volume bar from 6 a.m. Eastern Time a stopping volume of the high volume bearish moves? The last two high volume spikes are buying volume and price expanding upward. So, in FX, I don't assign volume as heavily as I will into an exchange based market where that volume figure is going to be A, significantly more accurate, and B, it's going to include institutional flow. There's not a great volume replacement in FX yet. The one that I have is, is FXCM's real volume, but that's only volume on FXCM platforms charting um, retail traders. So in FX, I'm going to apply more absolute value to just pure price action movements because most of these major pairs are going to stay so incredibly liquid throughout the day that when we do get those movements, it'll often be accompanied by volume. Um, and I'm really sorry, Sean, but I'm not sure which pair you're referring to. I think this came in when we were talking about the British pound. Yeah, I think I think that came in when we were talking about the British pound, but just kind of another example of that. If we did see a, a strong spike on a low volume move in FX, I mean, there's a lot of folks that are looking to hedge off risk, hedge off exposure, right? And there's uh, quite a few more market players that are on the sidelines in FX than what we're going to see in, say, like a small cap stock, where something like a volume spike is going to be significantly more important, in my opinion. Um, so FX, I'm going to assign a little bit more value on just pure price action. And most of the markets you're going to see me talking about on these webinars are going to be major macro markets. Um, major macro markets in which the, the, the uh, denotation of, of accurate volume reads is going to be difficult, if not impossible. To get you know, full volume on a currency pair, we'd have to count you know, every dollar and pound that was exchanged in every airport in the world, every, um, you know, every little street side kiosk. And I think that uh, technology is a few, few years off from being able to get such a statistic. Okay, I got like five minutes and a ton of questions, so I'm going to try to run through here in a rapid fire manner. Uh, what is your prognostic? He means uh, prognostication concerning the currency pair Aussie dollar and Kiwi dollar for the next coming weeks doing recent performance. Um, Kiwi, I like it to the long side. Um, Aussie, I'm a little more middle of the road, not too excited about either direction here. Uh, this is in the FIB extension. Let's go and get rid of those. A little sloppy. Yeah, I don't have a setup here yet. It might take me a while. Like 71.50 had given a quick little, uh, you know, pretty interesting spike here. A decent little amount of support. It hasn't been like a, you know, brick wall like level though. Yeah, I don't have a, now that I look at it, I don't really have a whole lot exciting at these levels on the Kiwi either. 
you know, longer term, there's some cool stuff going on here, but we're still a little bit elevated for me to be plotting your entry at the, uh, just at this point. Um, you know, this like 100 pip, like 100, but like you know, 90 ish pip zone here between the 50 fib and the financial collapse move and 618 of the big picture move. You know, that's a pretty attractive little zone that's caught quite a bit of, of support and resistance. And this was even before that secondary fib came in. See, I mean, this zone, you know, it's, 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 it's shown quite a bit of price action of recent. And this could be something I could use for stop placement, but I would need to get this a little bit deeper, maybe even deeper than this, this uh, quick little spike down here at 70, 75 to be able to get a, a palatable risk amount on a top side move. Uh, from Revio, any chance this video is recorded? Yeah, absolutely. I will have it on the YouTube feed shortly upon conclusion. And uh, if you want to get notified when that's available, uh, I will absolutely announce that over Twitter for anybody so interested. Uh, from Man Unique Centrone, glad to be here, better late than never. <laughs> I like it, I like it, appreciate your time. Uh, from Trishna, what time frame do you use to draw out your support and resistance lines? Really good question. I use uh, statistical sampling as a um, kind of a thesis, meaning I'm the opinion that the longer the time frame, the more opinions are behind each individual, let's call it observation thereby increasing the potential for it kind of playing out in the future. So what I do is I, I call it tops down. So I'm, I'm kind of adopting a different analytical term into just pure technical analysis, but I'll start with a monthly and I look to get like the big picture moves. So like there's a major move that took place here from the year 2000 all the way up to 08, put a Fibonacci retracement on that. And then sure enough, you know, even though it's a monthly chart, you'll see a lot of intraday price action taking place around these levels, right? You'll see quite a bit. Quick little resistance check off the 23.6, support off the 38.2. We got the 618 down here. It's getting quite a bit of action. Right there, about uh, 112.12 euro dollar. Um, I have a secondary move in here, that's the ECB move. Basically, I'm just looking for a high or low that has yet to be eclipsed on these longer term charts, and then I'll dial in and dial in, get a little tighter, a little tighter. And then, um, you know, if I see any glaringly obvious trend lines or channels, I'll draw those as I see them, assigning more value to the longer term studies than the shorter term ones. Uh, Haroon, good to have you here, my friend. Um, dollar cat heading to 2750, good call last week on saying cat might strengthen. Yeah, I'm a little uncertain on it right now. It's uh, kind of chop city for me. Kind of devoid of a strong trend. Do like the little check of support that we have down here, though. Little check of support, like right in here. Let's zone out. And it's a little dirty. It could be a, it could be something to work with there on a support play. Other than that, it's just kind of chop city for me for right now, and I'm gonna wait for it to break out of this range before looking to looking to get too active on anything. Uh, David Spain asked, and this uh, in referring to gold, um, the method I was using to look at that top side moving gold. Uh, can this can be traded the same way as a currency pair? So I'm not sure what's up if you're asking that question. If you're asking about the, the exact asset that I was charting, that's the CFD on FXCM platforms, which for uh, non-US residents um, could be traded similarly to FX. Um, as far as the way that I implement price action in those markets, I do it in a very similar complementary type of manner. To me, price action is price action. And unless there's like an overriding concern of, you know, some kind of tomfoolery in a market, I'm going to, I'm going to approach it in a similar manner, um, technically and fundamentally speaking. Uh, near Iran asking, what about uranium? Ooh, dangerous question. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, no, I don't chart uranium. I'm sorry. I don't have anything to offer you there. Um, you know, like I said, I try to stick to those macro markets, and I know uranium can have, like, you know, macro overtones or cues. It's just not something that I've ever put a lot of effort into to analyzing, so I don't want to, you know, uh, um, 
I don't want to represent that I have because I haven't. Sorry, buddy. From Sean Cooney, in your opinion, which is the great driver of uh, the global markets, oil or gold? Um, see, none of the above, banks. Because, and, and, you know, I say that because it's the bank's response to the oil crisis or, you know, uh, how a bank might, I guess, deal with current monetary policy. I think that's a bigger driver for global risk trends right now. But it does change. Uh, beginning of the year, it was probably oil, but it was oil because of the impact that, that could have brought onto the banks. But in my opinion, it's it's the banks. Maybe even central banks could be put in that statement, but that's something that we're going to have to wait for a couple months to find out about as the BOJ tries to go for another another big round. Uh, from Ryan, uh, Ryan Grohn, do you expect a hike from Ju uh, in July from the Fed? No, but I do think that they're going to talk something up for later in the year, probably with... Uh, <laughs> I think they're going to try to talk up September. Um, but no, sir, I don't expect a hike in July. This is going to be a meeting with a press conference, though. So I, I do, if memory serves at least, I do believe that we're going to hear from Miss Yellen uh, around that rate decision, and I do think that she's going to talk up the prospect of, of, uh, of a hike towards the second half of the year, or in the second half of the year that we're already in. Uh, from Marco Garces, all statements of Fed members open a higher probability of rate hike. The market has not reacted. Your point of view, exactly what I was saying, um, where I think that markets at this point are kind of like, okay, yeah, sure, Fed, we get it. You want to talk up higher rates, but you're not going to hike. Um, you know, it, 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 not too dissimilar than what we saw in the early portion of May. It wasn't until those those meeting minutes came out in May where that U.S. dollar trend really started to ratchet higher. Um, you know, but we got into May, right in here. Well, no, I take that back. It started to hit topside move a little bit earlier. But there's that ratchet that I was talking about. And the reason I was referring to that was because we had this resistance check that it held until then. It dipped off, and, and you know, I was very much of the mind, okay, well, this market's just pricing out the probability of actually getting, a, getting any type of hike. But when those meeting minutes came out and the Fed said, we think the market's under pricing that probability, this thing shot higher. And it didn't begin to come down until we got that NFP report in June. But I, I don't. I, I definitely don't think we're getting one in July. Um, I do think they're going to try to talk up September. Now, the reason that I'm using this theory, or that I'm that, I'm, that I even have this theory, is because there's an obvious persistence here from the bank to kick rates higher. Like if we go back to last year. The economy was not great in the United States. There was not a lot of inflationary pressure, at least in the data that the Fed was using. When we're talking PCE wage growth, when we're talking CPI, there wasn't a big case to be made for an interest rate hike. But in December, Janet Yellen dropped a line that I think was telling. She said that she feared a greater probability of a prolonged recession if she didn't hike rates. And that to me was telling. Because after seven years of ZERP, there's some distortion taking place across global financial markets. We're seeing stocks trade at all-time highs. We're seeing bonds trade at all-time highs, which is like a big anomaly. Traditionally, we'll see stocks and bonds, uh, stocks and bond yields track each other. Stocks go up, bond yields go up, because investors expect the central bank to move rate policy higher eventually to try to counter inflationary pressure, and we just simply haven't had that. Um, but they did. They did hike in December. They were persist persistent on that theme throughout much of last year, even in the face of a flurry of global risks. You know, like we had this little channel develop as we were kind of, you know, following this prospect along, you know, for, for pretty much most of the time. I mean, <laughs> the Chinese markets collapsed in the middle of this, and they still hiked in December. Just a few months after that, it spread out across the world. Um, so I do think there's a reason the Fed wants to hike rates. I don't think that they've necessarily told us what that reason is. I personally believe it's because of demographic trends. We have a lot of folks that are going to be retiring in the United States in the coming years, fewer folks in the workforce actually paying for those benefits. And if you look at the squeeze on like Social Security, defined benefit, pension plans, if rates don't kick higher, there's going to be a very big crisis in the not too distant future. And it's not just going to be on the banks. And this is a this is this is this is just a matter of time. It's a math problem, and you can't beat math. The only way is you got to redefine the rules of which mathematics is going to be used. And I think right now the Fed's still going to try to kind of kick this along. They're going to try to 
you know, uh, gradually guide rates higher. But you know, this year's case in point, what we saw in May is another example of that. The Fed doesn't have to talk up the prospect of rate hikes right now with a Brexit, with uh, with with a you know curious scenario in Japan, China still facing pressure. I mean, they don't have to hike here, but they're still showing a persistence to talk up that prospect. The big question is why. Uh, from Ralph, is there a link on uh, for YouTube you can use? Uh, send us with best uses of fib retracements. I have some articles. Um, I don't have. I don't believe I have any YouTube videos just for fibs. Um, but let me see what I have here for you. I do have some educational pieces on it. All right, this was from like four years ago, but uh, real. Just very general kind of piece about drawing a move and a retracement, trading off those levels. Um, that helps with the Fibonacci application, and then most of what I'm doing after that is, is price action. Um, for Michael Barrington, could you also look at Pound Oz uh, one hour through? Michael, I'm really sorry, but I'm already like seven minutes over. And, got quite a few more questions I want to try to run through. Um, but if you send me a chart on Twitter, I'll do my absolute best to critique it um, and give you some feedback. Uh, from Trishna, why would you go long on Aussie Yen when the monthly trend is down? Why wouldn't be trading the monthly trend there? I'd be trading basically like a four-hour trend there with the hope that the monthly trend flips. If it doesn't flip, even then, I might be able to run this to the top side, get a target out, something like that. <laughs> Sharif says, uh, manual backtesting can really help out in such situations. Yeah, so um, th that was to the question a little bit earlier about how to place buys or sells with a micro account. So this is a way of, of uh, you know, kind of hastening that learning curve and uh, you know, essentially simulating price action. I'm going to put this link in the chat box for uh, anybody that might be so interested. And basically, what you can do is you hit this little little button on the top of the chart for lock of view. And I'm just going to scroll back in time. I want I want to get back to a period of time with which I'm not familiar with the price action. You know, kind of like uh, you know, if you're going to play Jeopardy with your friends, you don't want to. <laughs> You don't want to use the Jeopardy episode that you have on DVR where you already know all the answers because that's kind of like cheating. All you're really doing there is cheating yourself <laughs> and your friends. It's not good. Um, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm just basically going to lock the view with a price action period with which I'm unfamiliar with. Now, I could hit the forward arrow on my keyboard to simulate, to simulate each individual four-hour candle. You know, the benefit behind that is that I could literally sit here and trade 24-hour candles in like 15 seconds, right? So if I see something like a psychological level, let's say I want to get better at trading off psych levels. I'm going to bury a line right here off 90 flat. I'm going to wait. Let's see if I get some let's type in inflection there. I already missed off, so let's go to the next psych level, 97.50. All right, so now I want to see what's going to happen when price action hits one of my one of my psych levels. I don't know which one's going to hit first. All right, there we go. Now I got a resistance hit off 97.50. All right, now I can scroll back and I can see. Okay, well the bigger picture trend was down, but near term higher highs, higher lows. I don't want to I don't want to sell this off. I want to look for a deeper retracement potential support level down here 96 and three quarters, potential level here off the prior resistance 95 and three quarters. I'm going to see if I can catch that entry. Just wait, not done yet. Not done yet. There we go. There we go. There we go. Right? Came down into my little support zone. Catch a top side entry. And I could place like a fictional stop below this low. I could do a profit factor of 200% of that stop. So 1 to 2 risk reward ratio. And then I could simulate 4 hours at a time to see how it would have panned out. All right. And it runs up a little bit closer to 100. When it gets 100 and I look at another resistance check off of the psych level, I could have plotting near-term price action and treat it as if it was a real environment 
where I was placing a real trade, but it's just all simulated. And I could I could place like a thousand fictional trades in you know um, seven eight hour window. You know, if I really want to test a strategy, this is an easy way of doing it because I could, with my own eyes, see what is going on here. All right, we got that hundred hit. Maybe you take a reversal off that stop above the high. A little bit of run, hundred pips of run, and then stopped out. Right, but by doing this, I could actually see the way the price action worked with that level, so that I could get an idea for how I might want to implement that in the future. Sure, if that's like the kindest advice or the uh, kindest comment ever, one of the best things I learned watching you trade. Do this until my eyes bleed. <laughs> that's commitment right there, folks. That's commitment. Um, you know, but you got to think uh, the the competition in a marketplace you're going against is folks that are you know really good at what they do. And there is a kind of Darwinian effect, you know, where the uh, those that are more experienced, that have more resources, that are often going to have a slight edge. Maybe it's information flow, maybe it's just knowledge, experience, whatever. But uh, for a new trader, I think the goal should be to get as much of, of an edge as possible. Mm, the easiest or the best way to do that that I know of is, is experience. Um, all right, I need to take the last question of the day because I'm way over time. See, there's a ton of good questions in here, but I'm trying to get one that it kind of wraps up a lot of them at once. All right, here's a really good one. Uh, Richard Angelus, aren't demo accounts best to cut teeth and see which stop loss strategies are practical, don't take out trades prematurely? Should we expect whipsaws this summer and reducing volume? So far, no. I mean, uh, you know, early portion of the summer is seeing the opposite of that theme. Um, Whipsaw is always going to be a possibility, but I think the big risk right now is a lot of the political risk that we have. Seeing the way that, say, like Sterling moves on the announcement of some of these political themes, like with uh, Theresa May, um, uh, PM Ascension a couple of days ago, Sterling was, was going bonkers around that. I think that's the big risk factors that we're now starting to see political news get focused on a little bit more, seeing volatility emanate from there. Now, in reference to the demo accounts, I vehemently disagree with that. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll use an example. I got a friend that's a professional baseball player. Even when we were kids, this guy was amazing at baseball. I love baseball. I thought I was good, but this guy was always way better. And, you know, the, the he just loves playing baseball. I mean, he loves taking batting practice. He loves playing catch. When we were kids, he was always busy playing baseball. And uh, he's a professional now. Um, and you know what he does? in the off-season on a spare time when he doesn't have to work. He plays baseball. He goes out in the backyard, he gets off a tee, he gets uh, he has a pitching machine, take cuts off the pitching machine. He plays baseball. He practices his sport for fun because he's committed to it. He loves it. So as far as the whole demo thing, I think that there's like an ego uh, aspect to attach to it where it's like, oh, you're not a trader if you're trading a demo account. Oh, there's no real capital behind it. I mean, if you love this stuff, you want to test out a lot of different things. You want to explore it. You want to find better ways of doing it. And so I think that the demo account is it's fantastic for even a professional trader. And I know a lot of professionals that still use demos to test out new theories or setups or strategies or even just to track markets they're analyzing to determine how they want to play into them in uh, you know, more of a professional format. That's just my opinion. You know, um, I have a, my own way of looking at markets, and, and with that said, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to be close to some folks that have, have, in my opinion, at least attained some great things in this life, and they've only done it through effort, experience, dedication, and working at it when most other folks are too tired or weak or, or just don't want to take part in it. So. Yeah, I think demo accounts are a-okay. Um, you know, regardless of experience, I don't think there's anybody that's 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 too good to practice in uh, in almost anything. But that's just my opinion. Um, but folks, 
I got to cut it for today. I went completely over time. For those of you that had questions I didn't answer, I'm very, very sorry uh, that I did run out of time. But feel free to hit me up over Twitter. I'll do my absolute best to get back with you in a timely format. Um, I'm usually able to respond back to tweets within 24 hours. And if I don't, it's merely because I missed it or got busy during the day. But uh, feel free to ask me any questions that, that uh, you want to have answered. I'll do my best to help out. But folks, thank you so much for your time. Have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.